Charlene, thank you for being here. Thank you, Christian, for having me. I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> Thanks. I don't know. I think you're the only other person that I know that is as fan of productivity and productivity tools uh, as I am. And uh, so it's very exciting to have a chance to geek out properly with you about these things. Um, long time so coming. I know, a long time coming. And like, I mean, like we've had many conversations around these things uh, over the years. But we haven't really sat down and like come up with like a formal theory or like a like a more formal understanding of it. So we geek out about this stuff, but we didn't really. I never asked you how you came to develop your strategies and and all that stuff. So I'm I'm excited to hear about that um, because yeah. you're um, like one of the most productive people I know. Um, so um, why don't we start with uh, what you're up to now and the, all the types of you know. Uh, things you're juggling, and then we can get to productivity. Okay, so that's a big question. Uh, I will start with a simple answer. I'm working okay. on the startup, and part of my job is talking to many founders and also product managers. Uh, I have a lot of experiences, so people come to me for advice. But if I just answer their question, it's, not, it's often not the most effective way. Like, the main reason is because people have three main behavioral patterns. The first one is, they say they want something. They expressly stated that. But what they actually want may be different. And what they actually need may also be different too. So there's like th these three types. And I will use a really simple example. So let's say I want to eat barbecue because I want to eat it with my lunch partner who likes barbecue. But what I actually want is spaghetti because I found a popular Italian restaurant on social media the other day. But what I really need now is actually a healthy diet because my stomach hurts. So, you know, you see, what's the problem here, right? Should, would I enjoy the barbecue if I end up going with my lunch partner? Would I have a good time? Would I get enough rest for my body and recovery? Um, and if not, why did I say barbecue in the first place? This may sound like a really small example, but this is actually what productivity to me means. It's all these daily tiny moments in life. Have you, Christian, ev ever been through something similar? Um, yes. I don't know if I, I think that's a really funny example because, you know, it goes to show all the variables that we hold in our head uh, as we're making these daily decisions. Then you're like you're factoring in the personal relationship with the, your lunch partner, for instance, um, your personal dietary needs, your personal tastes, their personal tastes budget, you know, like all these things like factor in uh, location, how far you'd have to travel to get to this place. Um, uh, no, I, I agree. I don't know if I have a sophisticated enough philosophy to to tackle it in that particular instance. Um, but yes, no, I see. And like you can imagine this translating to business or to or to any type of creative output as well. Right. Let me give you a business business example. So yeah, sure. I've talked to a lot of founders. I see this behavior repeated different ways. So many founders say, when I say say, they, express, they explicitly stated that they want to mm. find product market fit or they want mm -hmm. to learn from other founders, other case studies. But mm -hmm. that's actually what many of their role models recommend them to do. Instead of mm -hmm. learning from these theories, they actually want to take their lessons from experiments and experiences. Um, you know, hmm. but doing. Can you unpack that a bit more? Yeah. Yeah. So, do, learning by do, le learning from doing trial and error is what is how most founders learn. Even mm -hmm. though what they actually need may be a little bit of research to minimize the problem they are solving at hand, and better target the problem space. Hmm. So mm -hmm. these are two phases, right? They say they want to learn product market fit, but there's no learning action. It's actually just doing testing experimentation. And what they actually need is a little bit thought, a little bit planning, thought experimenting, mm. re-ranking their order of operation. So mm, they're doing mm -hmm. the testing the right thing. Mm -hmm. and, and mental models, right? Like, you know, uh, models exactly. about uh, economics, models about um, pricing, models about uh, psychology, um, marketing, all these stuff that like, if you know the, the um, rule of thumb sort of tricks, uh, it gives you like a lot of mileage in terms of like narrowing the search pace of, of what you do. So that's like, I think one aspect of productivity, which is planning, right? Like you're mm -hmm. 
trying to come up with, you know, a to-do list and you want to make sure that that to-do list is the right one. Um, yeah. And I and know so, you're, yeah. Go for it, go for it. No, I, I know you have a lot of mental models. Like you're actually one of the most thoughtful person I know, like in terms of philosoph philosophy and how we should do it, like having really good intention in the first place. Um, and I think that's what I want to bring to more people, having more mm. awareness around why they're doing what they're doing. Because what, what exactly, what, what we talked about were three types, right? What they say they want, what they actually mm. want, and what they actually need. And for mm -hmm. you, you, what you say you want equals what you actually want equals what you need. Because you're very, like, you have the intention. So uh, it's straightforward. You just go yeah. do it. I try. I mean, like, I often catch myself failing, right? Like, um, um, but there's, okay, so let's go to the primordial measure of productivity, which is tasks on a to-do list. Mm -hmm. And then we're talking about, like, what tasks should go into the to-do list, right? Mm -hmm. There's another measure or sense of productivity, which is, like, sort of, I think, a dangerous one to fall under the illusion that is feeling that you're being productive because you're checking things off of a productivity list, right? So it creates this incentive to add, for lack of a better word, BS tasks that you can just cross out and you say, okay, I'm crushing it today. I'm being super productive, but all the tasks were BS, right? Um, so how do, you, how do you avoid falling into that trap? How to not do BS and do the most important thing? Yeah. So it goes to knowing what's the most important thing, which is actually the hardest part. Many people mm -hmm. don't know because they maybe haven't tried enough. So I think the critical point is to have a lot of exposure, right? Broaden your horizon, um, try different approaches, try different ways of people doing things. And it may be overfitting from time to time because you're basically replicating an approach that doesn't work for you. But... It may give what you're doing and learning and copying the process. It may give you new ideas on what is good for you, what sticks, what you can bring to your system, how you can optimize it. And one thing I really love doing is just spending a week or two in a different country. Ideally, mm. a country I don't even know the language, not even mm -hmm. know the environment and people. And what that enables me to do is to just be in a really fresh state and question, why am I doing all the things in the first place? Why am I having all the system and second brain linked? Uh, why mm -hmm. am I uh, having all the automation? Like, what's the point of that, right? Really question it. And mm -hmm. I think that's what I wish more people can step outside of their current routine because mm -hmm. what they may be, what they want to attain may not be available in their current life. Totally. And well, that brings up a bigger, maybe perhaps deeper point than uh, than I was expecting to chat about, which is like the waking up from your um, sort of routines and habits that are sort of like unintentionally adopted that, you know, you just absorb from the environment, from media, from, you know, the social group you're in. But you're right that if you actually were to think it out and say like, OK, project your life out to to include the outcomes of these habits then the life that I will lead to is not the life that I want. And so mm. like, you need a pretty strong like shake up to, to uh, wake up from that. Um, so then, so I think that we're talking about two things. We're talking about aligning your productivity toward the right thing, which is mm -hmm. one, and I think noble goal. And I think like that's sort of like, maybe the big question in life is like, uh, what do I dedicate my effort to? Um, and I think, um, and I think that, like, honestly, like, recent world events, you know, post-pandemic world, all the economic uh, instability, um, you know, geopolitical uncertainty, all that stuff is getting people to question a little bit more, what am I doing? Mm. Um, and, but there's, so on one side, there's, like, what should we be aiming at? And then there's the other side, which is, like, okay, once you feel confident enough, how do you uh, execute Right. And how do you create these systems that you sort of like form a symbiosis with uh, that you can sort of like uh, blend between going creative to going execution robot mode uh, to going uh, sales mode to going, you know, uh, you know, strategy mode. Um, so maybe let's talk about that a little bit, like execution and like, OK, so let's say we have a to do list that we're excited about that we think, OK, this is as close to the 
real thing as we're going to get. What's your, your approach there uh, for decomposing tasks into smaller subtasks, all that stuff? So just to make sure we're talking about the same thing. Are you talking about once you have the list, how do you execute it? Or how do you break things down into a list that's worth executing? Uh, sure, let's do the second first. Let's okay. So we talk a little bit about a goal. So let's assume you have a goal that is worthy that you want to do. I think it, it applies to this 80-20 rule where just observe what action you are doing. Like there is a lot of monitoring softwares and apps that shows how you spend time, um, what apps you enjoy using most. Like I like to just observe how people do things. And for me, it may be uh, being on mobile sometimes. And when I'm on mobile, it's like quick capture and quick notes. When I'm on laptop, it's like mm. deep writing and deep flow. Like everyone has their own system, but just observe what your habits lead you today. And see what is one thing, What what is the bottleneck? that you currently experience? Is it because you take too many screenshots and never act on them? Is it because you have a lot of like reminder sets but never able to go through that list? Like what is what is flooding? And mm -hmm. it's a little bit like this uh, theory of constraint where look at that bottleneck and only spend energy improving that bottleneck. Mm -hmm. And once you spend some energy, the, the bottleneck gets better, it may move to a different state. You may be solving a different problem. Mm. But to me, it's always like one thing mm. at once because you, you couldn't predict what will be the next bottleneck. And yeah. having an overly complicated system sometimes take you, like it's not worth the ROI. Mm -hmm. No, totally. And it, you reminded me a little bit of systems thinking where you have mm -hmm. stocks and flows. Um, and so you can think of like your the information that you're dealing with is like stocks of information and the flows are like the things that get you to process that information, right? So like your mm -hmm. email inbox is a stock. Um, and and I think also one thing that I've re learned recently is like you, you can spend a lot of time building out a very complex system to deal with uh, flows that are later in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. But if you don't deal with the bottleneck as early in the pipeline as possible, then you're just sort of wasting time trying to predict for a future that, that may or may not exist, right? But you know you're dealing with a bottleneck at the, toward the beginning of the funnel, right? Yeah, um, and there's actually one thing Tiago Forte said that really resonated with me. So he said, like, his current rule of thumb of note-taking is to know where that note will sit in his final mm. portfolio of work. Mm. What that meant is basically mm. when you're reading a book, say that you like this sentence, um, mm. he will know exactly how that will influence maybe the conclusion of his next essay and then put mm. that accordingly. I think that is where I aspire to be because mm. in that way, I wouldn't save useless information, right? Like I would know right. exactly what I need, find the things I need and use the things I need. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, and this gets us to maybe... Um, another part of productivity, which is note taking, right? Like mm -hmm. we are bombarded with way more information than our ancestors ever had to face, you know, two or three generations ago. And so, and we also have these tools to capture uh, moments of inspiration, insight, or, or, you know, media that we consume, right? Um, so you mentioned Tiago Forte, he's like a big name in, in second brain productivity, digital organization stuff. Um, have you, for, do you use para in your life? So I, okay, so a little context is I am a little biased because I have taught and helped mentor two cohorts of his Building a Second Brain. So, oh, oh okay, so sure. So in those teaching and cohorts, I had to use para, but I adjusted uh -huh. a little bit. So that's around 2021. I was actually using Rome Research. And I mean, mm -hmm. you probably have seen it. I know you're a big fan of workflow -y, but mm -hmm. a part of Rome is everything you put there is, resor is resources, right? You don't really need the R in Para because it's a graph. It just works. Right, so yeah, what yeah, I yeah. had is I adjusted that to P and A. So just projects mm -hmm. and areas where uh -huh. projects are things that like an active list of what I'm currently focusing on, like just where I spend my attention on. And the areas mm -hmm. are things that's more like a garden where... 
I am、mm. nurturing and I want to plan something. It may not be happening this month or next, but it's an active area I want to spend more, like a lot of it energy on in my life. And I think that too is enough. Like archive,、mm, yeah, just like mark things、uh, out there.、Sure. But you know, I just need PNA to do what I'm doing now. Um, we should, I think, touch on like I was wondering how to approach the topic of all these tools because there's so many and they all have you know their different flavors and philosophies and some of them are more opinionated than others and you mentioned Roan Research,、um, you mentioned Workflowy, these are both great tools.、Um, Tiago Forte loves Evernote famously、um, and、uh, there's there's like Notion and Coda and all these amazing tools. Like I don't know if we want to do like a geek out about them. Maybe maybe next time. Maybe、um, next time. Yeah, yeah, because these are. I mean, like, I'm very passionate about this stuff. Like, I think about this a lot, and I'm surprised I, you didn't mention Tana based on what you said last time. Um. Well, I'm running my life on Tana now, uh, and I'm thinking like having a you know a specific a specific episode on Tana, um, but no, I do love Tana. I love. Um. So th- what you said about the、uh, the note falling exactly where it needs to go. Tana has a pretty cool way of doing that automatically. So you just capture the note, tag it with the right thing, and it'll、mm. go to the right place,、um, <clears throat> or w- all the right places that it needs to go. So it could be like the last line of an essay. It could be, um, um, it just immediately gets linked to everything, right? It's、so、like if you set it up in a in a correct way. But you、mm-hmm. could. But also, I will confess, like when setting up those systems, you can get caught up in the in the fun of building them, right? Like so. The analogy would be if you're taking notes in a in a physical notebook,、mm-hmm. um, you could go crazy in terms of like your indexing of that notebook. Oh, and on even pages, I will have these things. On odd pages, I will have these other things. And then there's a section for、uh, index, and there's a section for contacts, and there's a section for、um, something else,、uh, calendar.、Um, and you could get really crazy building out this notebook, but it doesn't really. Necessarily track with like your immediate priorities, right? And so、mm-hmm. I think that's why something like projects and areas are cool. Projects are like the tactical, specific. Like these are the things that I'm working towards, and areas are things like、uh, relationships or fitness or or you know broader, less defined. But there's not like one specific、um, number that you're targeting, but you sort of want to keep in mind like、um, that type of stuff. And there's so also there's so many different. Areas of note taking, right? Like you can take notes on books you read, you can take notes on classes you take, you can take notes on people, right? Like people、mm-hmm. you meet.、Um, so how do you approach the different kinds of note taking? It's an evolution. <laughs> okay. I mean, you knew I tried a lot of things, and it's interesting because at first, whatever tools、um, you pick can probably do most of the job well. But once you hit a certain volume, it began to break. I think、hmm. four years ago, I put all my people notes in Notion, but at the time,、hmm. their database wasn't strong enough, so it loaded really slow. Moved to a new tool called Clay. It's a personal CRM,、um, and then they changed it a ton, which to me is not as magical as、um, what it used to be. So、oh. I switched it back to you may be surprised, Apple Notes. It、oh has, no! But I heard, yeah, it's, I heard it's making a resurgence. Yeah, yeah. Yes, tell me about it, it. It is, and I think it has to do with it's so simple. Like to me, how to take notes is basically how to capture things fast.、Mm-hmm. And Apple Notes is just a native one, or if you're on Android, Google Keep, right? It's、mm-hmm. so easy to capture anything,、uh, and they're using text, as you mentioned with with Tana, to make things flow a little bit across hierarchy. So.、Mm-hmm. That is basically what I do mostly for just capturing stuff. And there、mm-hmm. is this tool you may have heard of them called Readwise, which is really good for re、uh, resurfacing notes that I may have forgot already. And there is that serendipity, like ten notes a day, fifteen notes a day. I just review it, or just I, when I I search it a lot because it was linked to my second brain. I I use Notion for that and. Whenever I want to, like, say, look for someone on creativity or、um, jamming out on productivity tool for thoughts, I can just search and all my notes, people, place, events, things, books, they can all show up in one place. Hmm. I see. 
And, okay, let's talk about Readwise a little more because, surprisingly, it's one of the tools that I haven't really checked out yet. Uh, or maybe I'm intimidated by the fact that there's another, like, habit loop I have to build around using it. Um, so I would love to hear your thoughts. Like, I want to hear your, your, your feelings toward it. So how long have I been using it? Probably four years now. And what I like about it is it works in the background. So think okay. of that more as an API, at least that's how I use it. I use it basically as an API where the input is all the sources, my Kindle highlights, Audible bookmarks, um, every like Insta paper, you know, all the things I read articles or listen to things on, they, Rewise has an API to connect with them. So basically the notes are imported and it can mm. export to your chosen app, Notion, Roam, Evernote, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. Probably not Apple Notes. Maybe they should build that. But mm -hmm. they can export to your chosen brain. And to me, that's enough. Because like once once it's being synced, what I see is notes I can easily search in Notion. Rewise is, is this invisible oh, layer. You just have to set it once and you forget it. Uh, the piece about reviewing is like there is a feature in the Readwise web app where you can go and highlight and, you know, do that. But I don't actually, I, I try to do that every day, but realistically, maybe there will be a week every month where I do that. And then it falls in, like I, I do other things. And then I remember it and mm -hmm. I come back and do it. But then, you know, it's once in a while thing instead of like mm -hmm. a daily habit. I see, I see. No, and people rave about it. People rave about Readwise and how it integrates everything. And um, I think I don't know why I have this weird like aversion to it. I don't I think it's I don't, uh. normal. Because there are so many mm. tools, right? And every tool yeah. is shaping our mental model. So, right. which takes a lot of effort. So I, I am also a fan of using as little tools as possible to mm. do as much as you want. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think like, what, if anything, like we could geek out, this is digression a little bit, but I think like in this modern age of uh, software SaaS, um, founders and startups can get caught in this uh, loop of just, oh, let's add another SaaS service for this, you know, this marginal need that we have and this another marginal, you know. And so that bill ends up becoming quite large. And also you get these data silos that then also you have to sort of uh, sync together every now and then and make sure that. So the cost of integration, even within your own mental model of migrating the events from one tool to another and like making sure that nothing gets lost in translation um, that is a, a, a super phenomenal point, like that you have to sort of be wary of. I still um, have Evernote that I haven't migrated to uh, yeah, yeah. my current tools, you know, and I may never get around that, but there is those kind of sunk costs here and there. No, and, and I think that's like a, a maturity thing too, right? Like we, we take probably way more notes than we actually need uh, in terms of like, you know, like long tail of usefulness of the notes. Like there's like, five notes that are going to be critical and like a hundred that are going to be kind of worthless. And so whenever you make a migration, it's a good chance to uh, uh, remove yourself from the weight of carrying those notes, even in the, you know, in the back of your mind where you're like, oh, all these notes that I need to review at some point at some, you know. Um, um, and yeah, and there, but the, maybe the exciting things for people is that there are these tools that help you keep track of, of your projects and your life. And it takes some amount of customization to make it fit for you. Mm -hmm. But there are also like so many people online that are willing to help you build that stuff as well, right? Um, Tiago Forte is one of them, you know? Um, and so that's note taking. Um, there's also, you mentioned personal CRM and personal relationships. I think that's also an aspect of productivity, sort of, you know, um, how did you approach that? How did you find clay? What, what benefits does it give you? Um, so the backstory here is, um, I wish I can remember my conversation with everyone and have the context to bring on next time, right? Like, Christian, mm -hmm. like, remember we going to, like, San Francisco, grabbing coffee, walking around, talking about way about what? You know, like, I want to easily recall them, but my mm -hmm. memory is not got that great. And that's why I had mm -hmm. a personal CRM in the first place. Um, it, before Clay, was Airtable, where I had so, so many columns, like, where they live, you know, all the things I want to mm -hmm. remember about people I meet. And then I realized that it's a lot of organizing. I, mm -hmm. I don't actually want to spend 30 minutes every day, like, inputting those data. Um... 
And then when I find Clay, like, I think it's around pandemic where they just sync with like, you know, your social media, LinkedIn, contacts everywhere. And it ser- it tells you the status updates um, of, of the people that you can like group and highlight and you want to prioritize, right? So it's done a lot of heavy lifting for me. I don't have to encode a lot of data that they can find from their social API. But I still find it a little bit limiting because it still doesn't capture the interesting conversations I am having with a person. It doesn't mm-hmm. record or at least doesn't explicitly record to my knowledge. Right, sure. <laughs> um, yeah, or, or, or use those data. So I realized it's not as useful. Um, and also the other thing is like, there's a lot of effective information and ineffective information, right? I don't need to record everything. I just need probably need to record like the one or two key highlights that would be useful. So knowing mm-hmm. what to take note is actually the biggest lesson I'm learning throughout this journey. Instead of like mm. trying to input every single data about this person I care about, like what is that one or two thing that makes them really special, that makes mm-hmm. them want to spend more time with them? So it's really taking mm. notes for myself and the relationship instead of like for an app to perfect this graph. Um, and now my structure is a lot more flexible. <laughs> so instead of like any of the tools I mentioned above, it's literally just maybe Apple Notes. And I can if I happen to take note of it, I will search and hopefully it will show up next time. So as you can tell, it's a very like hand wavy, unstructured, mm-hmm. Maybe it happens hoping the serendipity kind of thing. But I think that's how I'm viewing like relationships, networks more. It's not it's not mm-hmm. as transactional, but more as this mm-hmm. like garden I want to nurture. And maybe someday it will be for fall. And for now I will just totally. enjoy the conversation I'm having with a person in front of me. No, totally. I agree. And like I found myself, you know, building up my own personal CRMs and <clears throat> you know, having columns for address and birthday and um interests and and whatnot and like it it almost feels like imposing a square structure on a very like organic thing that you you almost are never in a position where you're like asking form questions to people you find out randomly you know much later in the relationship when their birthday is or where they're from originally or you know like and it doesn't happen in like the sequential like you know yeah sort of like government government form uh identification type of stuff uh, and so then you either have to deal with the fact that you have a lot of missing data in your like preciously designed thing, or you have to come up with a system like you where you're like, wait a minute, I need to readjust how I'm thinking about these things. Um, and to the other point that you mentioned that like uh, the notes that you take have to be just the key insights, you know, those key insights can just be mnemonic triggers, right? It could mm-hmm. be like, um, you know, a snippet of a conversation that you had uh, or a story that you shared. And it triggers the whole memory of like, oh, we were in uh, Mountain View, we were walking around, you know, like it triggers all the environmental stuff that all of a sudden like gives more context. And then like, oh, yeah, he, you know, they'd said that their sister is, you know, and so. Or um, even pictures. I I actually think Google Photos had an edge in this. If we take more pictures and they can, like the memory feature is is really good, right? And if they can actually extract helpful data from those pictures and remind us in the right time. I think that there's a lot of power in that because we just, when mm. we see something, it's, it brings back so much memories than reading a lot of mm. roles and columns and numbers. I know, totally. Um, which this is maybe the perfect segue to talk about another aspect of productivity and sort of like mental well-being, which is uh, reflection and self-reflection. So after you've taken notes and after you've sort of like written down your thoughts on certain things, going back over them and sort of integrating the learnings. Um, what are your habits, practices, philosophies around that? So my ideal state is to not have to organize anything because I think mm-hmm. AI should do that for us. Mm-hmm. I don't know if this is controversial at all, but that's how I see note taking, right? So, um, at first, like February, I was using ChatGPT. Like I have some custom journaling prompt and I wanted to know about me. Mm. But unfortunately, the memory mm. isn't great. So it forgets who I mm. am. So I couldn't just like ask whatever. Then I found a couple note-taking tools. Um, one of them that I'm still using to now is called Rollspot. And what mm. I love about it is like in addition to the routines and templates they can I can input every day, 
they have memory, like long-term memory about who I am. So I can ask uh, if I'm thinking about a question, like what what would, what would do you think, knowing what you know about me for the past few months? How, how have my values evolved? What decisions oh, am I avoiding cool. to make? How can I be more brave? Who should I reach out to? Like those are the kind of questions I can ask because that app has memory, like working, living memory of what I inputted. And that I think What's is the ideal called? state where, yeah. What's it called again? It's called roll spot. Like, you know, rolls that like, has the like roll, a spot. roll in an ex- Like a row in an Excel sheet? Oh, you mean how does it look like? No, 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 sorry, the name, like rows, like row oh, in just an Excel sheet. Uh, R-O-S-E-B-U-D. Oh, I see, I see, I see, okay. Got yeah. it, got it, got it, Rosebud, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that sounds amazing. I mean, that sounds like the dream sort of like reflection tool that I've been hoping for for a while. Um, the For journaling purposes, right? Like if you want to, that's also the crazy thing about journaling in my experience has been like you have like a very short term window of um, of review. So like say I'm journaling every day this week, I might go back and review a week, but I'm not going to go back and review the whole year. Mm-hmm. Um Unless I, you know, make a ritual around it and say like, okay, the last day of the year, I'm going to like read through all my notes. But then that sort of ends up taking the whole day. Um, and and it's not necessarily that the work, that the output of that process is going to lead to anything tangible, right? Like oftentimes it's just like, oh, hmm. And sort of like it sits inside, but it doesn't really amount to anything. Do you find yourself... Uh, being able to capture that and turning it into something actionable or do you how do you approach that so I have so I will share one thing that may make you like Rosebud even more and I will share the full story so um, my first favorite feature with Rosebud is their weekly summary one thing AI does really well is just summarizing right so mm-hmm. it's summarizing in Rosebud Thorn and I always learn something from reading those summaries because I forget what I wrote on Monday. It's like, it's, it hasn't been yeah. that long, but a lot has happened. So that to me is like a weekly snapshot of like, how have I grown? How, what, have, what have I learned? But that's just a piece of my note-taking journey. A lot of my notes also happen on pen and paper. And I still do that every day because there is something with just like writing that let me like... I, it's called automatic writing. That's, some, that's uh, how my friends put it to me, where when I write, I don't actually know what I'm going to write. Like the pen mm. just move and words just come through. And sometimes like new ideas, intuition just come up. And that's why I really love the journey. It's like, what keyboard could I replace? And mm. I think it's good to have both of them. Right? Like when I travel, I just bring my pen and paper notebook like that. I have one for every year. So I will take it mm. around the world as I travel and uh, find a really pretty place and just write at whatever comes to mind. I never look at what I wrote. <laughs> I probably should, mm-hmm. but I knew mm-hmm. at this point that I just never actually do that because my pleasure derives from the actual writing process. And to me, like writing itself is enough. And if I really do need something, I trust that my memory will like resurface it. Like there is that leap of faith I'm taking there, but that's how I view it. If I really want to remember something, go to the AI journaling app. If I'm just like writing for the pleasure of life, growth, I do that in pen and paper. Hmm, that's so interesting. And it's one of those lessons that like has been proven over and over and over again. That like if you want to retain stuff, if you want to, um, um, you know, really cement the knowledge into your working, you know, brain, that you should write it down physically. And and it's an idea that I've resisted. Like, I want it to be all digital. I want to be, you know, uh, I want to have access to it to be able to index it and search it, to be able to reorganize it if I want to. And, like, the limitations of a physical notebook is, like, you write something and then you want to sort of, like, no, but I want to add this in between. All of a sudden, you're, like, negotiating space on the paper. And then, I don't know, I get frustrated by that. But, however, I will say, you write stuff down. And there is this... Um, I don't want to sound too kooky, but like magic process of, you know, like you're, you're sort of like deploying your thoughts on the world physically. And that creates a very powerful effect um, 
uh, in your psyche, right? Like it, it lets you externalize your thinking and like lets you review it like objectively and, and you can reason around it as a thing and you can perfect it, honestly. Yeah. Um, and, and there's one more tool I actually forgot to mention, which is I, I do a lot of the journaling when I'm walking. So hmm. I just have the author record myself, uh -huh. right? I may like talk for yeah. 10, 15 minutes Many of them may not make sense, but then I put that transcript into ChatGPT or cloud and ask mm -hmm. it to derive some novel insights, surprising things. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I do like an easy raw input and have AI to like generate something that surprised me. Uh huh. I, I'm excited to share some Tana geekiness too, because like Tana has a uh, like it, it has a whisper integration, so it can oh, you can record perfect. voice yeah. notes. Uh, and it auto tags it and then it's so that that gets like fed into wherever you want it to go so you can have like these workflows that extract the themes from whatever you were rambling about and then it'll tag the thing based on those themes and then it'll fall wherever it needs to go um, so as a quick capture tool it's actually pretty awesome um, okay now you're uh, now I'm sold I had it downloaded I just never use it so I may try it today oh, oh uh, well like I can I can you know that I'm I, when I get into evangelization, evangelizing mode, I, um, no, Tana has been awesome. Tana has been a, a true upgrade in terms of uh, being able to organize my brain. And it took a few tries to get it right, to like build a system that makes sense for me and that, uh, you know, integrates the needs that I want to do. But also I was doing multiple things at the same time. I was not just switching over my productivity tool from Workflowy, which served every need for me, uh, to Tana. I was also recalibrating, okay, what am I aligning towards? Like, what, 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 how do I essentially defrag the number of projects, the number of areas so that like I can say, what is like the, the minimum number of uh, goals that still get me to where I want to go, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that is a healthy exercise. I'm sure you've done that multiple times. Like, uh, maybe we talk about that next. How do you approach the, the defragging of the cluttered mind? Huh. <laughs> I mean, I think aside from organizing, note-taking, meditation is my secret weapon there. Because mm. I, I think that's what is outside of the tools. It's almost like mm. I'm trying to solve a problem, but the problem, the solution doesn't lie within the frame and like try to look out. And context switching, like sometimes my best ideas just happen on a commute, on a drive. And mm. it just happened when I'm like, physically, mentally in a different state. And that's why I try to like import more of that state change into my day to day. And sometimes I think like writing has always been effective, but if I am way too cluttered, I just want to get out of what I'm thinking in my room and, you know, recenter into a different state. And that come like uh, stepping outside and stepping back in is a powerful enough reset for myself. Hmm, I see. Uh, and what type of meditation do you do? Uh, transcendental meditation. So mantra. Based. Oh, interesting. Mantra. That's fun. Um, yeah. And do you switch the mantra every now and then? Or do no, you stick no. to one? No, no. Always one. Because I think if I yeah. try it, it became like a shopping process, you know, and I get yeah. confused about what should I use today. And that's too much. So yeah, yeah, very yeah, simple. Yeah. Same same routine twice a day. Nice. Uh, morning and evening? Or what's the... Yeah. What's the uh, yeah. Actually, I try to do morning and evening, but usually it's like right after a very stressful meeting because <laughs> I think that oh. has the most uh, productivity gain for me. Like, I'm not going to mm. be able to focus anyways. Why not just do this? <laughs> I know. I like that a lot, actually. And that maybe is like the core, you know, mindfulness thing is like being able to tell when you need to engage in the practice, right? Um, like when you need to recenter yourself. Um, no, that's cool. And maybe like this is a good chance to talk about... Um, time allocation and like you know so let's imagine like we were a tour of what we talked about there's a to-do list there's uh, uh putting how do you decide what goes into the to-do list how do you manage the to-do list how you execute the to-do list um uh there's notes and what you capture the information you want to capture there's the processes of reviewing those notes and like sort of like self-reflecting but then there's like putting it all together. There's like capturing information, capturing tasks, and allocating time for them, right? Um, calendaring, scheduling, uh, all this stuff. How, what is your approach to time allocation? So 
so I have a very different answer based on the type of work you do. When I was a product manager at Google, uh, just as many other PM, the calendar is booked up to the 15 minutes, 30 minutes, and it's packed from mm -hmm. 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. or even sometimes later. And that's not optimal because usually humans work is not done in 15 minutes increments or before 8 a.m. and after 5 p.m. <laughs> so mm -hmm. um, if you find yourself in that more like hectic busy state, I have a different set of advice for you. I'm sharing what I'm doing now, which I like to work in sprints where um, instead of like sitting down and having alignment, most of my meetings today are execution, brainstorming, like collaboration mm. meetings. So uh, there, it's almost like a mini projects per se, like each one hour, 19 minute chunk is like getting a piece of the project done with someone that mm. I'm collaborating. And what is most important in this new structure is like the rest. In the past, I don't get to rest. I don't have time to rest. Mm. But now I at least have 30 minutes per two hour or within every two hour to like just breathe and reset, mm. can do meditation, can read a book, um, can try something else. And so I can bring my like, I can refill my tank and do the next two hours. I found mm -hmm. it a lot more productive to have those tiny break throughout the day than having like a jam-packed schedule and crash by the end. That makes total sense. How did you find the sweet spot, the number, like 90 minutes and 30 minutes? How did you find that? I think it's an experimentation. I tried the tomato thing, you know, a typical tomato. Uh-huh. Uh, Pomodoro, yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> that <laughs> Pomodoro. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 25 minutes or 45. I found that to be too short, especially when I'm mm. writing. I kind of write in yeah. at least an yeah. hour. Yeah. And yeah. that, like, 90 minutes is how my idea and, you know, creativity, like, time spent. And I only learned that through experimentation. Hmm, I see. Um, I think you're right. And I think it really varies depending on the type of work, right? Like if you're doing um, brainstorming meeting with people and you have to not just evaluate the ideas, but also navigate the, the um, personal sensitivities around the ideas as well, then there's two sources of energy that are sort of being uh, used up. There's like the people energy and then there's the idea energy. Um, and I think they compound like the more if you add a third category of energy, if you're also like, I don't know, working out at the same time, then it's like it compounds exponentially. And so the recovery that you need is is proportional to the number of energy sources that you're tapping into. Um, I try to not multitask. I mean, I, I actually tried yeah. doing this, like treadmill and podcasting, but I realized that uh -huh. I actually don't. I don't get most of the podcast content when I'm like running, you know, and when I re-listen re to it, I miss so many critical stuff. And mm -hmm. that's one reason why I don't try to not multitask. I'm very guilty of that, but trying. The other mm -hmm. reason is because I found myself the most productive in highly constrained scenarios. And mm -hmm. what I meant is 30 minutes before a plane takeoff. That's where I get the most of my work done because I know <laughs> I literally cannot use this laptop. So there is this urgency involved or I am just like, you know, waiting for someone to arrive five minute chunk or early for a meeting, like having a mm. couple minutes in order to write an email. Like those are my literally most productive bursts of time. So I try mm -hmm. to have those one to five minute tasks I can kill while th going throughout the day as like a reward for myself. And then the rest I plan for the creative brainstorming team collaboration and partnership meetings. Um, and what about in terms of broader areas of allocation? Say um, in a week, how much do you allocate to uh, brainstorming? How much do you allocate to like, uh, you know how like within any self-driven project, like you're a founder and you're sort of like captain of the ship, you find yourself wearing many hats. And the hats can be on the commercial side, they can be on the technical side, they can be on the content production side, they can be at like, who knows, strategy, how many different things. How do you uh, allocate hat wearing time um, per week, say? Mm, like, what is your it's ideal? Oh. Week by week, based on the goal of each week. In the earlier <laughs> phase of our startup journey, and maybe like, talking to a lot of customers, doing interviews, right? So a lot of time is spent in the research uh, research phase. Uh, now we have a lot more conviction about like what the market, what we're building. We spend a lot more time in execution, partnership, and uh, deal-making. 
Mm. And it may shift when our when we move on to the next phase. So I think the goal having a weekly goal is very crucial. And I am really fortunate that our team is great at that. Like they mm. complement my strengths really well. And then we kind of each hold us accountable because we see things from a different end. So I think even in startup, try to find collaborator, if not a teammate, or some advisor to be that goal accountability buddy. Cause that should detect how you allocate your time. Mm-hmm. Like if you are not no longer doing that many sales calls, maybe you should spend more time like researching or content mm-hmm. creation or building the next product, right? So that would mm-hmm. go back to what the goal is. And when do you determine the weekly goal? Like when in the week do you determine next week's goal? Or Usually how far ahead Friday do you Friday or Monday. So Friday mm-hmm. is kind of recapping and seeing how the goal has played out. Have we hit it? Like if so, how much have we exceeded or how much have we not ex- like failed to reach and use that to calibrate the next one Mm -hmm. are they always smart goals no Uh (laughs) i think (laughs) i am not that good with structures that's defined Uh by others um Uh i I think there's a (laughs) lot i love it a true founder (laughs) (laughs) um that probably is why i'm a founder but i think all the structures are good inspirations but once you actually follow it um you may tailor and I and tweak it to something that works uniquely for us I don't even know what's our like goal like I don't think there's a name for it but it's kind of this tested learning our team created as we implement it hmm I see um yeah and I think there's like uh stuff to be said about all these like business school um shorthand uh ways of doing things including smart goals um that are sort of good to know and sort of good to strive for, but in practice, very hard to, uh, like, actually implement uh, rigorously, unless you're in a big bureaucracy that, like, has all these checks and, like, you know, checklists. I don't to, know to... if it's effective in big bureaucracy. I think it's just, like, it ha- it's more common. Yeah. True. No, no, no. What I meant to say is, like, I'm not saying that it is more effective. You can just implement them more effectively in a big bureaucracy. Got it. Uh, then, oh no, and I agree. I mean, like, then it becomes part of this, like, um, this sort of BS type of thing where everybody's working on the compliance of the form and not the actual, not the actual thing. Um, but, but I do think like in, like, I think it's a good, um, sanity check to have, you know, like a testable framework for, Mm -hmm. did I reach this goal or not? Or like, how much did I reach at this goal? Um, Similar to SWOT for strategy, right? Like having a framework to start with and your team yeah. may take it different directions. But I think that frame, that the starting frame is always helpful. But totally. don't tie yourself to the entirety of it because you're probably going to build a little bit different business. So you will eventually find a way that works best for you. No, totally. And, and I think one of the learnings of mine for the past year has been that at the end of the day, if you want to be really satisfied, you have to build your own system. Like mm-hmm. you have to figure out like what works for you and what like drives your goals. And it's like sort of an unfair, I don't know, like it's like as a customer, I would like to have like something that just tailors my needs. Um, but you don't really understand the, the, like the connection from like actual value to where you're at, unless you start building out these systems and like, you know, uh, unclogging bottlenecks and um and uh looking at yourself in the mirror and looking at your systems in the mirror and, and challenging them um, yeah i think that's the same for founders creators like anyone oh, who yeah. is building something from zero to one yeah um and we're we have about like 10 minutes left charlene how about we chat about something different entirely and chat about um your book like the book that you published a few years ago Model Breakers? Model Breakers, yeah. You want to chat about it? Sure. Um, well, you wrote a book. That's awesome. You published it. Um, what drove you to write the book? So, again, a little backstory. I was writing, I was publishing a post every day. And mm-hmm. it was like early pandemic when I'm trying to figure out like how to write, what to create. And there is a topic that keep coming back to me, which is like, what does authenticity mean? What is values? What is the worldview? And how do we piece them all together? So 
I have a lot more questions than answer. And that's why I began to like research, talk to many people, interview them. And that eventually led to a project uh, that's a book and later became Auto Breakers. So it really is an evolution from just idea about how can we be more of ourselves? How can we really embrace who we are and bring our best to uh, the world that we find ourselves in? The context is a little bit uh, focused on just immigrants in America. But I have heard mm-hmm. from other folks who like UK, you know, Europe, even Asia, it, it, it works similarly. Like the similar principle around getting back to your values, knowing what you really want and practicing them in the world is the same. No, I, I think that's awesome. And I think it's like a timely message, especially like during pandemic, post pandemic. I think a lot of people found themselves like asking uh, what percentage of the things that I do is actually me versus the environment that I'm in. Um, and so I think the message is incredibly help, like powerful. Um, and you also make it very personal, right? Like you may, you, you bring your experience into the table and you like are very honest about that. Um, how did that feel in terms of like translating this message and making it very personal, um, for other people? It's a discovery process. It's similar to what we talked about at the start to where if you don't know what you need, go and explore right? Travel, talk to people, try many different things. And that's how I felt throughout the process, because I actually didn't know what stories would come up. A lot of them came up through the writing process, or after some conversations that made me realize, hey, I actually been through something similar, but for some reason, it get lost in my stream of memories. So I see that more as a getting to the truth of my message, and using writing as a vehicle to unpack that. I see. I see. That that makes total sense. And like, I feel complete alignment with my own writing journey. Um, and, but in terms of the content of the book, so you, you talk about, you know, finding yourself and, and um, finding your voice and being able to express it. Um, what are the, the tactical tips that are in the book or some tactical tips that are in the book um, uh, for people who are, and, and I want to be a bit more explicit. I want to be, uh, because you are a bit more explicit in the book about the narratives that we carry from uh, our cultures and, you know, like our, our, we are the product of our environment. And so like, how do we negotiate the parts of our environment that we want to keep as ourselves versus the parts of our environment that are just like inherited, right? Um, so I wanted to ask you like a bit more, you know, you know, tactically, how do you negotiate around the stories that we build around our identities? So... There is a lot, but I will pick one that is going to be helpful no matter you know how much you know about model breakers. I, it's, it's, it's called reframing. And you probably have reframed like questions or concepts in your life already, but I'm going to talk about reframing stereotypes. And to mm-hmm. do that, you first have to understand what kind of stereotypes do people actually have, right? And that takes a lot of self-awareness of learning about the environment, which some people can argue that, hey, like, it's the environment. Like, why should we do the homework? But, you know, for your own benefits, do it. So really learn, like, what kind of is it because of your race, your gender, like, your accent, your upbringing, your background? Like, people will make judgments unconsciously regardless. So learn what they may be. And if you have a couple of close friends, ask them. They may be honest mm. enough to tell you, right? That will be really helpful data points. Once you know how you're being perceived, it's your, it's up to you to come up with tools to navigate that. And mm-hmm. the most effective one is to like acknowledge that, hey, I know this is probably what you're thinking. And here is why it's actually not true. Like you need to provide a fact. Once mm-hmm. people are sold that, hey, you actually know them because you know what is in, in their mind and you have a fact that counter that, uh, it's a lot more believable. They became... Mm. It's a lot, you can convince them otherwise. Their, their mind is broken open for a new possibility of a narrative and you get to co-create that with them. So that is a three-part process, right? Acknowledge mm-hmm. what is there, break that with a, fra- fa- break that with a fact and mm-hmm. co-create the stories that you actually want together with them. No, I, I think it's beautiful and powerful and like there's this like resonance with this idea I've been thinking about a lot, which is like, um, do it wrong. You know, like whatever it is you're going to do, do it wrong. Um, and 
you're gonna, you know, like it just, it's an imperative to do something different more than it is to do it wrong. Like you're not, you're, like the self-preservation is going to stop you from doing something completely stupid, but it's going to be different from what your normal pattern would, would say. Um, and it allows for uh, situations where you are, say, mixed with a lot of, let's say, overloaded terms, like including like stereotypes, but like it could be just anything. It could be talking about politics. It could be talking about religion. It could be talking about so many different things. But if you do it wrong, then it allows for humor to emerge organically. And humor, in my opinion, is, has been the most effective tool to breaking that, the, 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 um, the pattern. Right? You, know, like you, you laugh at the silliness of life, and there's a bit of self-awareness, and there's a bit of a homage to the relationship. Because I am taking the time to put myself in your shoes to think about me or to think about the world in general. So not only am I aware of my stereotypes, of the stereotypes that I fulfill, but I'm also aware of the stereotypes that people fulfill and like on themselves. Um, and you can find like exactly the right intervention to celebrate both, celebrate mm -hmm. um, it in a way that, you know, causes laughter. And then you can share like how silly the world is. Yeah. Um, and also laughter just brings people closer. Like there is... I mean, it's vulnerability at its core, right? Like humor, laughter, finding that common ground, and also having the empathy to build that bridge. So yeah. it's similar to storytelling, like have a toolbox of um, common themes that will resonate, common humors, common jokes you can tell, and test them in different ways. Like over time, you'll build your own unique toolbox to navigate the world you're in. That's, that's amazing. I mean, I think that's awesome. Charlene, any anything you're excited about before the year ends? What are, what are your immediate next plans? Oh my gosh, so much. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's already October. I can't believe it. But I think a lot of what I'm focusing, I'm really, really bullish on how the next generation of AI tools will shape how we create, how we think, how we work, how we live. I think a lot of those answers are still up in the air. And... I am more in just like, let's go and define together and make and, and see what we can create. So I am very excited about that evolution. That's awesome. I'm excited too. I think the world ahead is going to be exciting and different and changing. Um, but I think as long as we can have open communication and vulnerability and honesty and like sharing values locally, um, I think we're going to be okay. Um, I bet. Well, with that said, thank you, Charlene. It's been awesome to geek out about this stuff. We have so much to cover. I mean, like we really didn't even begin to scratch the this surface. This is the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, it's I just am so beginning. grateful to be here. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Of course. I'm sure we'll do this again in a few months. Yes. See you next time. All right. See you next time.